Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Knows. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into a time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. A one-hour podcast special of a program that, quite frankly, uh, this show is all about, a salute to radio. Uh, This is an episode of NBC's Biography in Sound, Recollections at 30, 30th anniversary of the National Broadcasting Company, broadcast uh, May 16th, May 15th, rather, 1956 and uh, we will listen to this show in its entirety since this is a podcast special i don't have to make the regular cuts for our fav- for your local for the local radio stations so let's listen to this biography and sound on classic radio theater good evening ladies and gentlemen this is pat kelly greeting you from kansas city where nbc is presenting the coon sanders nighthawks orchestra Relax and enjoy yourselves now while the Coon Sanders Nighthawks go to work on some of these days. Oh, if it could only talk, that radio you're listening to. I mean, if it could only tell us some of the things it's broadcast during the past 30 years. If any one person had all this information, the entertainment, the lessons learned, what he could do with it. The good things. Good morning, my dear children. And the bad things. Information and misinformation. The debt of the United States has gone up ten billion more dollars. Drama and melodrama. Questions and answers, comedy and tragedy, war and peace and war. Music and madness. Recollections at 30. A salute to Network Radio on its 30th anniversary. And another in NBC's transcribed series of Biographies in Sound. Your narrator, H. V. Kaltenborn. How about that? The Kansas City Nighthawks, exactly the way they broadcast back in 1926, the first year of network radio. In Bologna, Italy, Marconi had already experimented with some signals on his father's estate and called it wireless. In Pittsburgh, Frank Conrad had already built his 75-watt transmitter in his garage and called it Station KDKA. November 15, 1926, 7.30 p.m. Born over a 25-station hookup, one radio network. For the first time, 10 million Americans throughout the country could hear the same program at the same time. Today... There are 203 NBC affiliates. As for listeners, well, there are 257 million radios in the world, half of them in the United States. We have grown fantastically. Tonight, we salute radio, which means, of course, saluting you, the listener. For when you come down to it, these 30 years represent your likes, your fans, your comedy, your music, Good or bad, they're yours. Once upon a time, you were just crazy about special events. Not that we weren't willing to cooperate. Our equipment was new, and we were just aching to break it in. We took our microphones just about anywhere, to the bottom of the ocean in a bathyspear, spear, high up skyward in a balloon, from inside zoos, from inside Egyptian pyramids and tombs. Much of this kind of broadcasting took place before we kept records, so we can't replay those descriptions of the great balloon ascents. But there are a couple of old characters who are still trying to make it. Malu Baloo with Artie Skirbahorn speaking here from the town park in Dolphus, Maine. 
where the annual balloon ascension is about to take place. The balloon uh, over there is being inflated right at the present moment, and I think Artie Skirmahorn is in a better position to see just how far uh, it has gone to this point. Will you commit, Artie? A horn here, and it's just about ready now to go into the air. Hello here, excuse me, Artie, but uh, I think it was 500 pounds because no, anybody knows that they couldn't get the balloon off the ground uh, without uh, sufficient pressure. Well, I, uh, back here, I don't mean to interrupt you again, uh, Wally, but uh, I am of the opinion that it's less than that. However, maybe you have figures a little later than mine. <laughs> yeah, well taken. Malou, and uh, I can see from here that I think they're about to wave the flag, which means they have inflated it to the extremity they had planned. Uh, the fellow is looking at the basket. Well, well, wasn't that too bad? What do you see from there, Artie? Anything? It just uh, disintegrated completely. Nobody's heard or anything, but it's just ruined. Hey, have a spare, I'm told, and they will get to work on that right away and start inflating the second one. The townsfolks are now walking slowly toward their home. In the early days of programming, they'd return to the special event throughout the day. Bob and Ray, we'll be back. Contests were also the craze. Swiss yodeling, singing mouse, speaking parrot. And if you tuned in on a sunny May afternoon in 1939, you heard this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the feature attraction, the first national crocheting speed contest ever held. Presenting your stitch-by-stitch -stitch reporters, Chain Stitch, Bill Stern. <laughs> Okay, Harry Bellow introduced us, so here we go. And now I can see a lady over there who just led with a left drop stitch, and now she's crossing over two hard pearls to the jaw. And somebody's got to go down. Why, I've never seen such excitement here among so many ladies in my life on all sides. No, you say, Bill, this is not boxing? No, this isn't boxing, Cam. Crocheting, crocheting, you know, needle. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, yes, that, those sounds of quiet a while ago. We're on the uh, we're on the twelfth green now, and we're just about to pearl. Very silent oh, people. Yes, nay, not golf. Crocheting, crocheting. Oh, well, I'll find out what this is all about before I get through. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was Hemstitch McCarthy just giving you a blow-by-blow -blow description of this crocheting contest, the first of its kind held over the networks of the National Broadcasting Company. But I think first I ought to explain just about what crocheting is. Crocheting is a double-stitch, single thread over the under needle by a skip space needle thrust diagonally through the pico half double block used to increase the ekitu seifui, which is Latin for the overhand crawl used by some in preference to the cumbersome old-fashioned methods of jerking the chain to the increased loops formed by the inverse threads of the triple space often seen in North Dakota. In case you were wondering, that was authentic. Not that we ever claimed Skermerhorn and Baloo were. At any rate, we just can't leave them up there. And this is Artie Skirmahorn standing here at Belfast, Maine, where the Belfast balloon, uh, the second one, is about to be uh, released into the air. Uh, Wally... I think okay, Eddie, over there. Wally Blue, as an interesting sidelight, is going inside the balloon. They've uh, now... Artie, would you make a distinct uh, definition between balloon and balloon? A lot yes. of people have been calling me Wally Balloon. And uh, I want to know who's doing this. Uh, uh, all right, Wally, it's Wally Baloo who is going in the balloon and uh, will describe uh, the sensations of, uh, of going up in a balloon. I here guess I'm ready. If you want to just, uh, I'll talk to you by the two way as soon as they let it go. He's now stepping off and getting inside the balloon. When you get inside, Wally, you just uh, talk to us via the two way communication. Uh, they have removed the ballast here now, and the balloon... Hello? Hello? Uh, Artie? Yes, uh, Wally? Hello here on this end of the wire. Hello? Hello? Yes, uh, go ahead, Wally. I'm all set. Anytime you want to release... Whoa, whoa! They're releasing it now, and it's uh, going up into the air. It's about 20, 25, 30... Hello? From the balloon that I can... See the earth dropping away uh, down below. It's going to be a beautiful afternoon for a balloon, balloon ascension. Or a balloon ascension. Balloon. W.W. W. Balloon. Artie Skirmahorn? Hello, Artie. Hello. I can't hear you at all, W.W. Uh, 
But uh, I can tell you this, if you can uh, hear me, that you're just a speck in the sky now. Hello, in the balloon, and I can hear you well. I'm up probably five, six hundred feet now, and I'm floating out over Penobscot Bay, and it's a beautiful sight. It's wonderful to be up here all alone. I can see down there the earth, the green hills to the westward. Um, that's about all I can see. It seems to be more water. Uh, hey, Artie. Hello? Yes, Wally? Uh, I think the wind is out to sea. Yes, you've drifted over the open sea, and it's caused a great deal of consternation here. Uh, we don't know just what to do about it. Are there any strings I can pull? There's a lot of feverish activity going on about me here, Wally, uh, trying to get you back. Uh Uh-huh. But you stay in contact with us, fella. I won't go anywhere, believe me. And, uh, we'll bring you back as soon as possible. Even when radio was barely developed, you wanted news and more news. Over pioneering KDKA, the Harding Cox election returns trickled through to a handful of Pittsburgh listeners. News! You insist on knowing what's happening, and you want to know right away. The National Broadcasting Company presents a special bulletin, Trenton, New Jersey. Bruno Richard Hauptman was electrocuted at 8.47 tonight for the murder of the Lindbergh baby. We interrupt... Our regular program to bring you a special broadcast. We take you now to Montevideo, Uruguay. We have just seen the grass sea explode five miles from the coast. The ship has been scuttled. From the NBC newsroom in New York, President Roosevelt says that the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor from the air. One moment, please. President Roosevelt has just signed the war resolution. We are now at war with Japan. The White House has just made an important announcement on the war. And to bring you this story, we interrupt our program to take you to Washington. This is Ralph Howard Peterson in Washington. I have just returned from the White House where it has just been announced that the United States is now using an atomic bomb, the most powerful explosive yet developed. It was with the inauguration of Herbert Hoover in 1933 that we started the news flash system of interrupting the network. It was back in the 20s that radio swept the listener off his feet with sensational news coverage. More and more persons tuned into the radio for news. War came, and you weren't just interested in news, you demanded it. So we went everywhere, bringing each battlefield into your home. I myself broadcast from Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands, from an underground station in the fortress of Verdun in France, and from a mobile unit on the front lines in Holland. There were many exclusives. In mid-March 1938, NBC was in Vienna broadcasting Hitler's ruthless annexation of Austria. On December 8th, 1941, you heard another exclusive, Bert Silen and Don Bell describing the bombing of Manila as it was underway. Hello, NBC. This is Bert Silen speaking from Manila, and this time I've got a real scoop for you. Manila has just been bombed. In fact, right now it is being bombed. The all-clear signal had sounded, and then, without warning, Japanese bombers started bombing Fort William McKinley, Nichols Airfield, and the RCA transmitting station. We hope this is coming through. We don't know exactly what's happening on the outside, but we do hope that the transmitter is still on the air. And now I'm going to see if Don Bell is up there on the other microphone, if he is. Look it away, Don. At the present time, we're standing here on the right bank of the Pasig River. There's been a terrific bombing over there. There's been uh, anti-aircraft fire going on for the past 10 or 15 minutes. It's quieted down now, and we do believe that the Japanese planes have left at the present time, and they have also left an enormous fire which is burning somewhere in the vicinity of Fort McKinley and Nichols Field. We are waiting at the present time for our colleague, Bert Silen, to uh, get up on uh, uh, top of the uh, building here. Hello, Bert, are you on? Hello, Dad. It's the elevator boy ran out on us, and I had to climb up eight flights of fire escape. 
so I'm a little bit out of breath. But in the meantime, some of the rest of the staff here have checked up, and we definitely, we definitely concluded that the fire is now out at Nichols Field. That was the last we heard of Silent and Bell until 1945, when the Japanese released them from prison and Bert got back on the air with the words, as I was saying when I was so rudely interrupted. War changed radio by forcing it to become more flexible. Peace came as suddenly as war, but soon there was another war, and the tape recorders went back into combat. At the end of what President Truman once called the Korean police action, we summed up. Listen. Listen again. Two ten again, and he's twelve o'clock your position at uh, about four miles. He is an unidentified. He's a he's a bogey yet, but you know what I think. I will not. I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. You can go. I will not. NBC News and Special Events presents Transcribed. This was Korea. A review of the sounds that recorded one of the strangest wars in history. Here again is Leon Pearson. It began on a Sunday in June, a mere three years ago, and yet there are those who call it an eternity. I think the worst part of any firefight is the silence that prevails between bursts of enemy machines on fire or rifle fire. They're pretty close now. We're getting fire from both slopes now. Walking up a very narrow path between two slopes. And we're getting fire from both slopes. I finally placed my machine behind a tree. And I'm getting down low behind the tree so that I, they don't sight me. Hey, that's a Korean company commander giving orders to his platoon to move out, which will probably be an attack on the forward slope. That is the slope that's to my immediate front. It's up about 100 to 150 yards. Seems like those artillery shells are landing in the back of my neck, whereas they were landing 200 yards to my right. Political broadcasts date back to the 20s. Al Smith, Herbert Hoover, Norman Thomas, Hughes, Bora, Roosevelt. Later, we aired the fireside chats. But we also aired the critics. Remember Huey Long? What is the trouble with this administration of Mr. Roosevelt? And of Mr. Johnson, Mr. Farley, Mr. Astor? And all their spoilers and spellbinders? They think that Huey Long is the cause of all their worry. They go gunning for me. But am I the cause of their misery? Why, they're like old Davy Crockett, who went out to hunt a possum. He saw in the gleam of the moonlight that a possum in the top of the tree was going from limb to limb. So he shot, but he missed. He looked again and he saw the possum. He fired a second time and missed again. Soon he discovered that it was not a possum that he saw at all in the top of that tree. It was a louse in his own eyebrow. And now it is with the PWAs, the GWAs, the NRAs, the AAAs, JUGs, and the GINs. And every other flimsy combination that the country finds its affairs and business tangled to where no one can recognize it. More men are now out of work than ever. The debt of the United States has gone up ten billion more dollars. There is starvation. There is homelessness. There is misery on every hand and corner. But mind you, in the meantime, Mr. Roosevelt has had his way. He's one man that can't blame any of his troubles on you alone. He's had his way. Back down in my part of the country, if any man has the measles, he blames that on me. But there's one man that can't blame anything on anybody but himself, and that's Mr. Frank von der Leyen-O Roosevelt. Politics fascinates you. Sometimes it even frightens you. 
We know you go without sleep on election night. With the returns, you get commentary. Remember this gem from that early November morning in 1948? We are approaching that point which I have predicted right along, that as we got in, the country returns, the very strong lead that Truman showed in the beginning would be narrowed down. I am inclined to think that while it is a very close race on the basis of the figures as they now stand on our board, Dewey has the best chance. Another listener also remembered. And Mr. Captain Barn was saying, while well, the president is a million votes ahead in the popular vote, we have yet to win. When the country vote comes then Mr. Truman will be defeated by another hundred percent. Not that I want to change the subject, but Bob and Ray are still out there, and I predict we are going to hear from them soon. This is Artie Scramahorn again, speaking at uh, Belfast, Maine. Uh, just a few moments ago, correspondent W.W. W. Ballou went up uh, in the balloon, and it uh, went way out over the open sea. It's just a speck up there in the sky now. Uh, we discussed at great length methods to bring the balloon back, and we settled on using the Beaufort's gun, the 385th... Uh, underground balloon barrage company arrived on the scene and are now uh, attempting to uh, bring down uh, the balloon. All you balloon here, honey, it's a scene of panoramic beauty spread out before me. However, I can hear in the distance uh, firecrackers or something probably in celebration of this uh, epic annual flight, the first time that a radio announcer uh, has taken it, I believe. Is everything all right with you, Wally? Yes, uh, I can see the firecrackers, uh, every few seconds down there. As a matter of fact, there, are those firecrackers, Artie? Uh, uh, no, uh, actually, Wally, uh, they're reports from the Beaufort's gun. Uh, that's, uh, puffs or puffs of flak. Well, they have got some target out to see. Uh, no, Wally, they're not. Uh, some abandoned ship or something? Uh, no, Wally. Uh, well, you just stay with it, Wally. We'll be back in a little while. How many times have you tuned in your radio just for music? To fill us in, Ben Grower. Yes, H.B., from the simple strains of a studio pianist filling in during those embarrassing lapses in early programming to full-scale operas. In the beginning, there were the A&P Gypsies and the Clico Club Eskimos and the Ipana Troubadours. The network had hardly started when we molded entertainment and instruction and came up with a show that became a living room and a schoolroom phrase, music appreciation. At the microphone, Dr. Walter Damrosch, who opened his program with a warm... Good morning, my dear children. For 15 years, Damrosch went into schools and homes. You know, those broadcasts were a lot of fun. Listen. Now, the greatest symphonic composer that ever lived was Ludwig Beethoven. He wrote a beautiful symphony called the Pastoral Symphony, which means Symphony of the Countryside. He loved the country. He lived in Vienna and used to go out walking way out beyond the city in order to see the green trees and the fields and the growing grain. And so as he walked around there, he sometimes came on a village festival, on a holiday, when the peasants around Vienna had a good time together, dancing, making merry, eating and drinking. And he pictured this in his music, in this lovely pastoral symphony. This has a little portion in it where the village orchestra begins first. The horns give us the rhythm and then a solo instrument. Then the horn takes it up. A 
and so on. Various instruments of this little village orchestra. Let us listen to this fun. Dan the villagers dancing to the music. <laughs> The Pastoral, Dr. Damrosch and his studio orchestra. And this. The Pastoral conducted by Arturo Toscanini. It began in the mid-30s. The maestro was in Italy. NBC wanted him to broadcast from America so that everyone, regardless of pocketbook or locale, could hear his music. But Toscanini would not budge. He would not return. A flurry of cables from New York. From Italy, silence. But finally, we went to Italy to do the impossible. Toscanini came, and he stayed. Not that he didn't retire every year. I'm too old, the maestro would say at the end of each season. But he said it 17 times. From 1937 to 1954, Toscanini and the NBC Symphony held the country spellbound. a break here in a moment after I remind you about the sale going on now at MyPillow.com. The MyPillow.com slippers. My slippers? Delightful, wonderful shoes. They're not just indoor slippers. They're an indoor-outdoor shoe that you can wear anywhere. I have a pair at the radio station, and I would have bought two or three more pairs. Unfortunately, they're out of my size because this is a clearance sale that they've got going on right now. Uh, the shoes retail for nearly $100. They're now on sale at $25. Clearance, all sales final, uh, limit 10 pair. Go to MyPillow.com and uh, click on the radio listener square. Use my promo code Wyatt or call 1-800-928-4715. 1-800-928-4715. Mike Lindell's My Slippers Do For Your Feet, What He Does For Your Sleep. MyPillow.com, promo code Wyatt. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox continues now with more of Biography and Sound. From May 15, 1956, a salute to radio, recollections at 30. There were symphonies, and there were operas. Fidelio, La Traviata, Aida, Otello, Falstaff, The Masked Ball, and there was La Boheme. Toscanini, who received the score from Puccini's very hands to conduct the world premiere of La Boheme. Fifty years later, Toscanini conducting La Boheme again, this time over the American radio. It was my privilege to be the musical commentator for ten years on the Toscanini broadcasts. The last was two years ago. Here's how I reported that event later. As the familiar muted French horn theme swelled up, Maestro seemed sunk in a reverie. For a moment he looked up, smiling as though he heard a familiar voice. Then as the accents of brass came pounding through the score, he seemed to retreat to a corner of the podium with a baffled expression. Then in a moment his face cleared. He looked immeasurably younger, angry and triumphant. His mouth opened with an expression, a silent roar of defiance. Suddenly he was a towering giant of strength, outliving even Wagner himself in his knowledge and perception of the music. So the concert went with alternating moods of anger and tranquility through the Tannhäuser Overture and the Bacchanal to the final selection, the Meistersinger Prelude from Act One. And as the crashing chords of the climax approached, all of us in the booth were by now craning forward, hanging with deepest tension on every accent of the Maestro's baton. Just before the last chord sounded, Maestro stepped off the podium. There was the final crash of sound. The baton slipped from his hand. One of the violinists picked it up, handed it to him. He took it unseeingly, the slender stick dangling limply from his fingers as he slowly walked off the stage into the wings 
happy retirement. There was a time when the pause for station identification was anything but short. The announcer would suck in his breath and rattle off, this is station WEAF, WEEK, WJR, WTAG, WTIC, WGR, WLIT, WRC, WCSH, WCAE, WTAM, naming every station on the hookup. That was in 1926. The few months and several breathless announcers later, we bought the electrical chimes. They cost only $48.50 at the time, but think of all the trouble they save as we now take a short pause for station identification. Adopting drama for radio was a natural. John Berrymore was on the air in 1922. And in the years to come, Brother Lionel and Sister Ethel were to have regular shows. Theater names became a fixture. And in 1938, we took a giant step. Real-life drama, spoken by an ex-corporal named Hitler, were already underway in Munich and the Sudetenland. America, aware that there would be repeat performances, was jolted sober. Dramatists buckled down to business and started writing experimental plays for radio. First to be signed up, Arch Obler, his first play. On the winds of the night, we bring you a story whispered in the night. Scene, a room in semi-darkness. At a table sits a man, tall, gaunt, his heavy face lit occasionally by a random beam of light reflecting off the polished barrel of a revolver. This is Paul Martin. As the revolver twists in his nervous fingers, the thoughts in his mind twist and turn, twist and turn, twist. Gun in my hand. Gun in my hand. In all my life, I've never had a gun in my hand. Smooth gun, hard gun, cold gun, cold in my hand. Bullet won't be cold. Warm bullet, hot bullet, burning hot, hot as the blood. No, can't think of that. Lift the muzzle of the gun. Hole as black as where I'm going, one way entrance to eternal blackness, turn the muzzle up and press the trigger. Trigger cold against my finger, cold as death, but life is colder. Press the trigger and stop it, press the trigger. No, no, I can't, got to wait. Yes, my chance to think. Think it all out clearly for the first time in my life. How it started. Why it's ending this way. Think it all out clearly from the very start. Then... Press the trigger. School today, Paul. There's a start. First day of school. How old was I? Nine or ten. She kept me home, away from others. I didn't know why until that day she said... School today, Paul. I said... All right, Mother. She took me to school into a room full of more children than I'd ever seen. I was so happy. I wondered why her face was white and set. She said... Miss Edwards, this... This is my son. I... I want him in your class. Please, be kind to me. Before the teacher could answer, Mother hurried out of the room and left me there. Teacher's eyes were on me. Small eyes. Worried eyes. Thin mouth, open, turned to the faces lifting below her. Your attention, children. I... I want you to meet a new classmate. His name is... Uh, Paul Martin. For a moment, not a sound. Row on row of children looking up at me, staring up at me, gaping up at me. And then... <laughs> one of them started laughing. <laughs> Another laughing. Another and another. Laughing, laughing. I stood there, little boy, looking down at their twisting mouths, my ears filled with the sound of them, making fun of me, I knew, but why? Why? Ugliest boy in the world. One type of radio drama had already entranced the female listener. Soap operas went on the air in 1930. Two years later, just plain Bill modestly settled into a time spot and right on his heels, one man's family. First appearance, April 3rd, 1935. Here's one of the early installments. One Man's Family, brought to you by Tenderleaf Tea. One 
one man's family is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and their bewildering offspring. Tonight, we present Chapter 8, Book 29, entitled Complications in Domestic Relations. And this is how it is with the barbers. Laura Parker, the thorn in Teddy's side, has been removed. The curly little redhead has been returned to her father when Paul learned that she had run away from home, not because of financial straits, but because she decided she wanted to live her own life. With Laura out of the way, Teddy feels happily secure again, although she still possesses her head of red hair, which she obtained at the beauty parlor during her orgy of trying to be beautiful. Father Barber and Clifford are grooming the skipper, alias J.D., for the coming Better Babies Bureau baby contest. And Claudia is showing signs of heading for some kind of deep water. What it is and how it's going to affect her relationship with Nikki, the family can only speculate. This early afternoon, with Jack not yet home from college, Mother Barbara and Betty sit up in the former sewing room, sewing and chatting, enjoying themselves thoroughly. Yes, Jack always was an aggressive youngster, even when he was little. Uh Uh-huh, but he doesn't mean it. Chapter 8, Book 29. One man's family still together today, 21 years later. Suppose this smooth program, just once, were not too well rehearsed. Suppose just once, the members of one man's family did not get along too well together. Here's Bob and Ray. And now, Tanglefoot, the greatest name in flypaper, brings you another episode of One Fella's Family. Today's episode entitled, Paint Up, Clean Up. It's taken from Book 22, Chapter XXIV, pages 15, 16, 17 and two sentences from the middle of page 18. It's shortly after nine in the morning as we look in on the butcher family. We find Father Butcher. Uh, uh, Feli, have you seen my purple plate? And Mother Butcher standing just inside the door, and she answers, What? And then Father Butcher. I said, Feli, have you seen my purple plate? Will you be quiet announced and let us do it now, please? Yes, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to be helpful. Yes. What were you saying? Fool announcer. Then, Fairly... then he said, then she says, and then he says. That's perfectly obvious. It's we know what team. we're saying, thank you. We were here for more rehearsals than you were. Well, I, do add well, I didn't more have words to be here to your... for all rehearsals, you know. Well, you should see I the mean, end I just of the do the commercials and, and I introduce little... the show. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think that it's in the contract yeah. that I have to take any guff from either one yeah. of you two. Fairly, fairly, fairly. Well, you... well, let us do the program and yeah. then we'll talk about it later. Yeah. Yeah. What were you saying now, Father? Yeah. I've lost my place here now. Cool I think you said something first. Well, you were looking for paint. Yeah. Oh, oh. fairly, have you seen my purple paint? Purple paint. Now, what do you want? What would I want with purple paint? That's where we were. What do you want with purple paint? He wants to paint the garage with it. She knows what I want to do with it. Will you be quiet? Well, now, this isn't right. We've never had this before. Never, never in all the years I've been... Young man announcer, come over here. I have been a character actor for 38 years now. You've been a character, period, pal. I know... When I hear a cue, that that's when I'm supposed to start acting. You even forgot what you wanted the purple paint for. It's written right on the script. I just yelled out, you want to paint the garage. No, it was to paint the rosebush fence. Well, you're not going to paint the rosebush fence purple, are you? Why not? Why not? What's the matter with that? Why don't you mind your own business, announcer? This is our problem, not yours. None of your business, what color we paint the rosebush fence? Well, I... Don't say it's my business, but I don't think it's her business to tell you. When are you going to stand up on your own two feet? Where's your backbone, pal? Character actor portraying the same role. Honestly, I I think I know what color I want to paint the rose bush fence. Scott, are you related to Mr. Messy or something? No, I'm not related to Mr. Messy, ma'am. What is that supposed to be? Go to some some kind of a radio announcer school? No, can't announce at all. Don't know your place. Well. Now then. I'm not in the mood, Fanny. For what? To do this confounded script. Well, you're on the air. You can't just say you're not in the mood. <laughs> you better can it, folks. Time's run out. Oh, am I going to burn. Man. Part of the sign-off wasn't on the air, 
here. Now the engineer is trying to mess it up. Well, if you'd all mind well, why don't you all show up for rehearsal for the land's sake? You've been listening, listening to one fellow's family. Brought to you by Tanglefoot. He was a commercial adult. Will you get off microphone, please, sir? Mumble all you want in the far corner. Brought to you by Tanglefoot, the greatest name in fly paper. Today's episode, entitled Paint Up, Clean Up, was taken from Book 22, Chapter XXIV, pages 15, 16, 17, and the middle of page 18. My wife hears about this. One Fellow's Family is written and produced by T. Wilson Messy. This is a messy production, isn't it? This is a messy production. The first quiz and audience participation shows. They're hard to track down. I put a current events quiz on for high school students on station WNYC in the middle 20s. As early as 1927, Hollywood listeners gathered around the radio and competed with one another in who could first cry out the answers to the announcer's questions. Stakes in these question games have gone up and up and up. This is Horace Heights, bearing the glad tidings that we have $1,000 in our pot of gold. Now, here's the way we want to give away the $1,000 in tonight's pot of gold. Pot of gold. The first big giveaway. There follow the quiz kids, take it or leave it, truth or consequences. Discussion shows, such as the Chicago Roundtable and Town Meeting of the Air, were already on. Audience participation shows were also part of our programming. Quiz shows were very popular before we knew it. One program took the best ingredients of all these shows. Information, please. <laughs> Wake up, America. Time to stump the experts. Trot out your toughest questions and send them to us with the right answers. Four experts every Tuesday night will answer them correctly or pay you $5 for every question that stumps them. And each question accepted gets you $2. Our master of ceremonies is Clifton Fadiman. Literary critic of the New Yorker magazine, Mr. Fadiman. Good evening, everybody. Mr. Franklin P. Adams and Mr. John Kieran are here again this evening. Our guests of honor have uh, both been with us before, Mr. Oscar Levant and Mr. Ben Heck. Are you all ready, gentlemen? Here we go. The first question is from Mrs. A.B. Churchill of 27 Washington Avenue, Nyack, New York. The first lines of the following sets of couplets will be read. And you will have to complete them. Are you ready? One. Ten little Indians standing in a line. Ten little Indians standing in a line. Miss Kieran. One walked away and then there were nine. Very good. <clears throat> nine little Indians swinging on a gate. Miss Kieran again. One fell off and then there were eight. <laughs> he certainly knows his Indians. Eight little Indians climbing up toward heaven. Miss Kieran. One fell down and then there were seven. <laughs> Seven little Indians picking up sticks. One broke his neck and then there was six. <laughs> that was Mr. Chair, and I needn't tell you. Six little Indians playing with a hive. Mr. Chair? One was stung and then there were five. <laughs> and now you other gentlemen can leave the room and come back in about three or four minutes if you wish. Five little Indians on a trap door. One fell through and then there were four. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kieran. Four little Indians up in a tree. One jumped out, and then there were three. <laughs> three little Indians out in a canoe. One was drowned, and then there were two. <laughs> two little Indians playing with a gun. One pulled a trigger, and then there was one. <laughs> <laughs> one little Indian living all alone. One little Indian living all alone. Following he the... died and now they're unknown. <laughs> Good enough. We didn't have much money in 1932, but we laughed anyway. At one point, you could hear these regular programs. Groucho and Chico Marx, Stoop Nagel and Bud, Burns and Allen, Jack Benny, Ed Wynn, Al Jolson, Jack Pearl, Bert Lahr, Easy Aces, Eddie Cantor, Fred Allen. Fred Allen, the man who capitalized on the fluff. The man who could poke fun at anything. Allen's nemesis was the quiz show. Remember the night he and Don McNeil got together? 
Wake up, folks. Here it is, the revolutionary quiz program, Break the Contestant. Break the Contestant is brought to you by Lefkowitz's Liverwurst. Oh, Lefkowitz's Liverwurst is the finest in the land. When you want the best in Liverwurst, Lefkowitz is the brand. It's round and firm and it's fully packed and you get twice as much. Try feeling a Lefkowitz Liverwurst is the skin you love to touch. Oh, it's chock a block full of vitamins, it's nutritious and delicious. Try serving it after the opera nights with cold cuts and with conditions. You can buy it by the inch, your foot on the Bowery or at the Ritz. When you want the best in Liverwurst, it's made by Lefkowitz. Folks, do you suffer from Liverwurst hangover? Does the Liverwurst you eat keep you awake at night? Try Lefkowitz's Liverwurst, the Liverwurst that comes with a sleep guarantee. Lefkowitz Liverwurst lets you sleep. Why? Because Lefkowitz's Liverwurst contains sheep livers. No more counting sheep at night. The sheep livers. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't expect it there. These sheep livers are counted for you at the factory and then stuffed into Lefkowitz's liverwurst. Remember, if you don't sleep after eating the big economy size seven-foot liverwurst, here's all you have to do. <laughs> return the greasy string from the top of your liverwurst, <laughs> and Lefkowitz will send you by return mail. This offer is not good in Canada or in the United States. And now, on with our quiz, break the contestant, and here he is, your contestant breaker, Don McNeil. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. Now, our first contestant, this gentleman, your name, sir? Lomax Nishball. Uh, <laughs> what is your occupation, Mr. Nishball? I work in the automat. I'm a lettuce bender. Uh, <laughs> lettuce bender, the automat? Yeah, sometimes when they put a salad in one of them little compartments, the wet lettuce hangs out and they can't close the door, you oh. see. And you? I bend the lettuce back so they can close the door. <laughs> With rhubarb, it's stiff. I bite it off. I... <laughs> All right, Mr. Nishball, are you ready to play Break the Contest? Yes, sir. How much money do you have? Well, I ain't got no money. All I own in the world is what I got on. Oh, you've got to bet something. Well, all right. Tell you what, I'll bet you my coat against your coat. Mr. Nishball, you got yourself a bet Nishball. here. Nishball. Yes. <laughs> what category have you chosen? Uh, music. All right, it's your coat against my coat. Now, here's your first question, Mr. Nishball. Who wrote the Cachaturian saber dance? The Cachaturian? That's correct, Mr. Oh, Nishball. correct, really? Yes, you oh. and my coat, I'll well, take it off here. Thank you. All right, fine. You now have two coats. Would you like to try for four? Four coats? Yes, sir. I'd like to try for four right. coats. All right. In one word, finish the line of this popular song. Bongo, bongo, bongo. I don't want to leave the what? Bongo, bongo, bongo. It's one word. Manana? No. <laughs> bongo, bongo, bongo. I don't want to leave the Congo. Oh, that's a song? Yes, you lose, Mr. Nish. I'll oh, take my coat back and your coat, oh, here, too, you take you your mind. coat. You have the both coats now. Yes, All right. right. Uh, uh, what's your next question, uh, Mr. You, McNeil? What, what are you betting this Let time? me see. What could I... Oh, my belt. I'll bet you All my belt. All right. <laughs> or one belt. What uh, was Peter Tchaikovsky's middle name? Bongo, bongo, no. bongo. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, it's lost Elliot. again. Yeah. Uh, take off your belt. Yeah, yeah, I lost yeah. again. Thank well, you I'm, very much. I'm gradually getting the hang of it. I'm yeah. getting the hang of it. Uh, what do you want to bet now? Well, what could I bet now? Yeah. Well, all I've got left to bet is my trousers. Your pants. You'll be sorry. <laughs> Come on, give me the question. i got to win back me coat and belt, Mr. McNeil. All right, for one pair of pants. Who wrote Alexander's ragtime band? Alexander? No, I'm sorry. It was Irving Berlin. Could you repeat the question, no. please? <laughs> could you, uh... Could you repeat the answer? Now quit stalling, Mr. Nushball. You lost your pants. Come on, take them off. Give well, them all right, Mr. I don't know what... I can't. There's your pants, Mr. Nush... Oh, thank you. My goodness. Oh, Mr. Nushball. I thought this might happen. Yes, you... Why did you put on the pink bloomer? Which way is Phil Spitalny? Which way is... Baron Minchhausen, Jack Pearl, was always good for a laugh. Well, well, Baron, I'm delighted to see you. Well, Charlie, of all the people <laughs> in the whole world. I haven't seen you in a long time. Where you been? I just come back from the design. Oh, you did, eh? Yeah, I just come back. How'd you get over here? I came over on a ship. How, how was the food aboard the ship, Baron? Food was just so-so. Oh, just so-so. You know something, Charlie? Make every meal I had to eat soup. With every meal you had to eat soup? I had to eat soup. Was it compulsory? You see, I was... Hello? <laughs> <laughs> I say, was it compulsory? No. <laughs> tomatoes. Oh, tomatoes. Tomato. <laughs> no, they didn't have compulsory. Oh, say, by yeah, the way, but, back, just, a, just a moment. Did but, you did you know that Jimmy Durante has been looking all over this theater for you with a gun? What do you mean? 
He's looking for me with a revolver. With a what? I say he's looking for me with a revolver. <laughs> with a revolver, yes. Why, why he's looking for me, why? Well, he said that you called him a dirty name. I called him a dirty name? He said that you swore at him. Oh, what a liar! Yeah, what a liar! Wait, 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 wait. Now, now, don't get excited. You'll get high blood pressure. No, not me. I'm anemic. Oh, no. <laughs> Listen, Charlie, I give you my solemn word. I never called him a dirty name, and I never swore. Well, then how did it happen? Here's how that comes out, just like it was. All right. Uh, what day is this today? Today? Yeah. Today is Sunday. Sunday. That was four days back. That was witness days. You see, I'm going out with my... Wait a minute. What day did you say? Witness days. No, I was no. going... You mean Wednesday. Yeah, in the center of the week, like, no. you know? <laughs> Wednesday, Wednesday, named after the god Woden. No. <laughs> Wednesday's days is named after Tuesday. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> Charlie, you see, Wednesday's days, I was yes. going in the country with my car. I see. Well, as, well, wait, as wait, I'm wait, driving... Wait a minute. Tell me, uh, what, what time of the day was this? Oh, this was maybe 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock? 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock a.m. or p.m.? Uh, so I'm going... I mean... <laughs> what was that? What? I say, was it, was it 9 o'clock a.m. or p.m.? <laughs> So I'm going out in my car. Yes, I'm going Why out. don't you answer Please. my question? What? Was it 9 o'clock a.m. or p.m.? No, no, no. That's not nice. What's not nice? Now, I don't like that. Now, you hear that? <laughs> now, what are you me. talking about? Now, I know what that is. Now, oh, don't oh, say oh, that. You do. So, so I'm going out All right, all right. Wait a minute. Now, I don't you like You know what it is? Yeah. Well, what is it? About the farmer's daughter. No. I don't like <laughs> Just a minute now. Will you calm yourself? Look. Yeah. I'll make this a little more clear to you. Yeah. Was it nine o'clock before noon or afternoon? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So we going to look. Will you please tell me the time of the day you were driving in the country? Nine o'clock. <laughs> nine o'clock a.m. or p.m. No, A.Z. That was. A.Z. A.Z. What do you mean A.Z.? After supper. That's good. In 1926. The network started off the broadcasting day with setting up exercises. Today, the exercise is more intellectual. You see, the theme hasn't changed, and the goals of network radio are still three. Entertain, instruct, inform. The radio itself can't talk. It's up to us, listener and broadcaster, to make the demands, fulfill the demands. For the past 55 minutes... We've saluted radio and you. Don't feel badly if we've left out your favorite comedian or voice. Remember, it's been 30 years. A lot has happened. This is the Kraft Music Hall, starring Al Jolson with Lou Bring and his orchestra and chorus, and our guests, Arnold Stang as Gerard, and the world-famous violinist, Yehudi Manuel. So keep on looking for a bluebird and listening for its song. Yes, I'll have a real good time. Glorious time. I'm all dressed up, of course. Yes, indeed. A leather necktie. Mm-hmm. Regulation police, double strength suspenders. Yeah. Yeah, good solid snaps. Sleeve garters. Uh-huh. <laughs> they snap nice also. Uh-huh. You can't start off with a song. Now even when things go wrong. Now you you even look better. Kingfish, this is a pretty good second-hand car you got you. Yeah, it costs fifty dollars and uh, really a honey in it. Yeah, how far is this car gone, Kingfish? Oh, it's been broken all right. It's gone one hundred eighty-nine thousand miles. Yeah. <laughs> Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is yours very truly, Little Jack Little. Mister Fields, Charlie wants to say something to you. Yes. Oh. Hello, Mister Fields. Hello, blood poison. <laughs> It's me, Groucho Marx. The March of Time.
time. Oh, I know where my baton is. It's right here in the hall. Oh, no, McGee, please, not on Sunday. Don't you... This is Ben Bernie, the voice of experience speaking. Elsa. And now the time has come to lend thine ears the au revoir pleasantry. Recollections at 30, written and edited by Jerome Jacobs, was produced by NBC News for the NBC Radio Network. Your narrator has been H.V. Kaltenborn. So many voices, so many sounds of the days of radio when radio was truly great. Classic Radio Theater bringing you an episode of Biography and Sound Recollections at 30. And you heard so many great voices. So many people who are no longer with us, sadly, but were responsible for creating the base of the greatest radio shows of all time. All righty, we thank you for tuning in. My webpage, ClassicRadio.stream. That's ClassicRadio.stream. Stream our shows. Learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can find our social media links. You can buy me a copy that helps us acquire additional classic radio collections. Thanks, Richard, for some more copies that you bought us. We appreciate them so much. I'm Wyatt Cox. Thanks for tuning in to this special podcast edition of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox.